Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second day of the meeting on conventional magnetism and novel probes in heterostructures. structures. I'm Zhu Xi Luo, and I will be chairing the first session today, which is about Moray magnetism. Um, we're very happy to have Professor Kim Fai Mac from Cornell University as a first speaker. He will uh, tell us about correlation physics in semiconductor Moray super lattices. Uh, Bye, you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, this talk is not entirely about magnetism, but I will cover, you know, some parts related to uh, magnetism. Oh, uh, advance. okay, so uh, yeah, I, I think I will be probably uh, quite tight in time. So I will just acknowledge the people involved in this work first uh, before I talk about the work. And uh, this is, uh, the, the, these are the people in uh, our group who actually uh, have actually done the work. Uh, we share a group uh, with Professor Ji Shen at Columbia, at, at Cornell University. Sorry, uh, it's too early in the morning, probably. And uh, and uh, I will acknowledge each individual, uh, uh, you know, when I talk about their work. And I also want to acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, the um, theorists who help us in the uh, on the data interpretation of the data, as well as calculations. Uh, Alan McDonald from UT Austin, Vi Elsa from Cornell, and Liang Fu from MIT. And we also thank uh, the Columbia team for providing extremely uh, high quality uh, TMD crystals, without which we cannot really see most of the things we uh, actually have observed. And also acknowledge uh, the Japanese group for providing us a, a boron nitride crystals, as well as the funding sources for this work. Okay, uh, I think I probably don't need much introduction of Mori physics, uh, because of probably there are two talks yesterday uh, talking about this. Uh, just very brief, uh, the, the, uh, when you put two uh, monolayer Van der Waals materials on top of each other, or actually even multi-layers of uh, Van der Waals materials on top of each other, uh, either make a small twist or the two materials are different, having, say, uh, a different lattice constant, a, a Moray super lattice structure is formed. And typically, the length scale that we are interested in is about 10 nanometer. And so there is actually a nice separation of length scale that is much longer compared to the atomic length scale of each individual material. So that actually allows us to separate the low energy physics described by the Moray flat bands in the system, which enhance the interaction effects. And one way to think about, uh, one convenient way for me at least to think about a Moray physics is to treat a, this uh, Moray pattern or the Moray site as actually artificial Moray atoms that trap electrons uh, with its Moray potential. And the electrons can interact with each other and can hop between sides. So it's really like a lattice model physics. Uh, and I don't need to talk too much about this. Uh, this field actually was really stimulated by this discovery of superconductivity uh, in twisted bilayer near the magic angle. And ever since then, so many people have been really working on uh, this combination of uh, the graphene Moray system uh, including twisted bilayer graphene superconductivity, the quantum anomalous Hall effect, as well as a the more uh, ABC trilayer graphene, uh, twist uh, angle aligned with boron nitride that also produces a Moray pattern and strong correlation physics. Okay. And uh, well, I will be mainly focusing on the semiconductor Moray super lattices. And let me just point out actually experimental wise, the difficulties with a twisted bilayer graphene. The strong, uh, there is a magic angle here, and uh, the strong correlation physics actually only occurs very near the magic angle, which is about 1.05 degree. And if you actually increase, uh, just deviate from this angle, you know, by about 0.1 degree, you can quickly lose the, the, the strong interaction physics. And this is a result because of the zero energy gap in the graphene system. And actually, you don't really have this problem if you change graphene to a, a semiconductor because of the energy gap in the system. And so our question is, can we build a Moray super lattice based on uh, monolayer semiconductors? Can we get rid of the magic angle problem? We call it a problem because we don't want it to be that sensitive on the twist angle. We hope that, you know, with a wide range of twist angle, because typically in the material, uh, we have disorder in the twist angle. So can we just get rid of a, this magic angle problem and get much more robust a, a interaction physics or correlation physics? And the um, semiconductor that uh, we will be using is a, a monolayer transition metal dichrochrogenide semiconductor, TMD. And uh, its structure is like this, a monolayer of its 
This material consists of three layers of atoms with the middle layer of the transition metal atom sandwiched between two layers of calcogen atoms. And if you look top down, it actually it looks like the honeycomb structure, just like graphene, except that the A and the B sides are now occupied by different atoms. So inversion symmetry is broken and energy gaps are open at the K and the K prime point of the brittle zone. And a very simplified a band structure of the material is something like this. Uh, in, in the pristine form, the Fermi energy is located inside the big energy gap. Typically, it's about one to two mv, uh, one to two electron volt. And uh, so it has two copies of direct energy gaps at K and K prime. They are related by time reversal operation. And uh, because of spin orbit coupling, uh, due to the relatively heavy uh, transition metal atom, uh, the spin states are split at the K and the K prime point, but they are opposite split uh, to preserve time reversal symmetry. Okay, so this is a uh, very simplified uh, band structure of the system, but it describes the low energy physics quite well. So let's consider uh, <coughs> what happens when we put a, uh, two TMD layers together. In this case, uh, we uh, make a TMD heterobi layers. For instance, WSE2 on WS2, these are two different materials. And if you don't do anything specific, if you don't try to angle align them, then they will form something called a type two band alignment in semiconductor heterostructure, which looks something like this, that the conduction band of the WS2 layer is the lowest energy and the valence band of the WSE2 layer is the highest energy. Okay, so that's why it's called a type two because one belongs to one layer, the other belongs to the other layer. And the dashed line is the Fermi energy, which typically in experiment can be tuned by gates. And now if you imagine that you actually reduce the twist angle uh, of this two bilayer to nearly zero angle, zero degree. And uh, because the two materials actually have a 4% lattice mismatch, as a result, it forms a Maurice super lattice structure even at perfectly zero degree alignment uh, due to that lattice mismatch. Actually the Maurice period is given by this formula. Uh, A here is the uh, lattice constant of the WSE2 layer. And the delta here is the 4% uh, lattice mismatch. So basically due to this lattice mismatch for small twist angle, uh, the Maury period is actually not that sensitive uh, to a small change in twist angle. Okay, so the structure will pretty much look like this as long as you don't really uh, change the angle measured in radian by, you know, uh, about 4%. So uh, the Moray pattern will give rise to a black uh, reflection and then, you know, uh, produce the Moray flat bands in the mini Bruin zone, uh, which schematically looks something like this. Still it's a type two band alignment, conduction band, lowest energy conduction band in WSE2 layer, WS2 layer and highest energy valence band in the WSE2 layer. Okay. And uh, it's been shown by uh, Ellen McDonald in 2018 that actually the low energy, low energy physics if you can tune the Fermi energy of this system to uh, say these Moray bands in the system, uh, then it actually can be mapped to a, a single band Hubbard model. So uh, in some sense, the uh, TMD heterobilayer is actually the simplest a Moray system because uh, it's just described by a single orbital Hubbard model. Uh, so look something like this. You can think of it that uh, each Moray site is an energy trap for electrons an electron can tunnel between sides with an amplitude T and then uh, with the onside repulsion U. And uh, typical uh, T in this system is about one to 10 MeV. And the U, uh, you, you can estimate from the size of the one year orbital in the system is, is about 100 MeV. So U is typically quite a bit bigger uh, compared to T. That's what our expectation. And, um, it's a, well, uh, one word to mention is that it's actually a frustrated lattice. So we sort of expect that uh, there are going to be many competing states with similar energy. So probably a rich base diagram is there. Okay, uh, just uh, finally the, the, for the brief introduction to compare with graphene, uh, just by layer graphene, there are multiple degrees of freedom, the valley, the spin and the layer, and the bands are uh, topological so that we cannot really uh, uh, construct a one year orbitals to describe the physics. And so uh, I think these days people uh, tend to think that, you know, probably uh, the tested by layer graphene physics is a little closer to quantum Hall physics. And on the other hand, the TMD Moray system, uh, especially for the heterobilayer, which you only have a isolated single band in the system, uh, there's only actually one, uh, you know, uh, 
twofold degree of freedom remaining only, we call it the spin value log degree of freedom, or you can think of it as the value pseudo spin degree of freedom. And uh, there's no one year obstruction, the bands are non topological, and the description of the physics by a lattice model is actually valid. Okay, uh, then I'll go to the experimental uh, part uh, of this talk. Uh, first, I will tell you, you know, the observation of the mass state, and uh, then I'll just move on from there. So a few words about how we make uh, these samples. Uh, we basically use the mechanical exfoliation technique to prepare the different components of the layers, right? And uh, this is an example of WS2 on WSE2, sandwiched between two gates made of boron nitride uh, crystals, they are dielectric materials and then a gate by the graphite, top and the bottom gate, which you can apply electric field as well as change the doping level uh, in this heterobilayer. Uh, the heterobilayer can be contacted by graphite electrodes or can be contacted by platinum electrodes if we want to do some transport measurements. And uh, the structure is like this, as I mentioned. And the convention here that I will use uh, in the following talk is that if you have one electron uh, per moray site, uh, we call that a, a full filling of the Moray super lattice. That's filling factor equal to one, uh, but it's corresponding to half filling of the first Moray band. And only if you put two electrons on each Moray site, and then you get the filling factor equal to two, uh, then uh, you get a full filling of the uh, Moray flat band. And uh, just a couple more words about you know the the fabrication and the measurement. So this is actually not twisted by layer graphene. So uh, for those experimentalists who are interested in this, uh, is that uh, you, if you use, you know, if you make twisted by layer graphene, you usually start with a single piece of graphene. Uh, you tear them apart, then you rotate the angle and just restack them together, right? Uh, but uh, for this material, you can see that actually it's consisting of two different materials. So we have to predetermine their crystal orientation before we assemble them together, right? Because we actually have to make them, target them to be near zero degree. And to do that, we use a nonlinear optical technique, uh, which is a polarization resolved second harmonics generation technique, which can help us to map out the crystal orientation uh, of this layer first. Then we actually align them within about 0.5 degree accuracy to make the heterostructure. And the 0.5 degree actually sounds terrible uh, in uh, for twisted by layer graphene, because if you're really off by 0.5 degree, you completely lose uh, in this magic angle. But again, here, the, there's no magic angle in this uh, system. And because of the lattice mismatch, a 0.5 degree mismatch actually plays little role in it uh, usually. And uh, physics is actually very reproducible from device to device. And uh, in terms of experiment, we probe both the charge and the magnetic response uh, of this uh, by layer system. So uh, here is a simple example of a two-point resistance measurement, not four-point, two-point. And the resistance versus filling factor, this is filling factor zero, one, two. And you can see that as we decrease the temperature from 150 Kelvin, uh, the resistance, two resistance peaks are seen, a filling factor one and filling factor two here. And uh, there is a divergence of resistance, a filling factor equal to zero, and that's expected because a uh, zero filling factor is corresponding to the fact that the Fermi energy move out of the Moray band and into this big uh, band gap, which is one to two EV. Okay, and filling factor two is corresponding to two electrons per Moray site, right? And uh, that's corresponding to a completely filled a uh, Moray band. So it's a, a just a simple band insulator. And so we, we, uh, we do have a resistance peak there. And filling factor equal to one, uh, corresponding to a half field moray band, and without interaction, you would expect that it's a metal, uh, but with interaction, uh, the electron actually try to avoid a double occupancy of each moray site. And you can sort of think of it that the energy band is now separated into the lower Hubble band, and the upper Hubble band by an energy scale, roughly equal to U. And so by just looking at the temperature okay. dependence, yeah, is there a question? Oh. Okay. Yeah, uh, by looking at the temperature dependence of the uh, filling factor one resistance peak, it vanishes at about 150 to 200 K. So we basically can estimate a, uh, well, a lower bound estimate of the U is about 20 MeV uh, for this a uh, Hubble gap here. And I call it a lower estimate because a, uh, for, for a interacting system, uh, such a gap is also temperature dependent. 
So we just really a uh, rough estimate. And uh, recently we have done some compressibility measurement and the uh, measured gap is actually bigger than this is about 60 MeV. And uh, of course, there's an alternative explanation, which is not a MOS day, but uh, very closely related to a MOS day is a charge transfer insulator proposed by Liang Fu in this system. And if you're interested, you can read this paper, but still the physics is driven by the strong on-site Coulomb repulsion. Well, uh, for MOS state, uh, one thing uh, important to verify that this is MOS state is to probe the, uh, the presence of local moments. So the question is actually, can we probe uh, the presence of local moments in the system? And well, uh, the local moment physics is actually best revealed by the Curie-Weiss law, right? And uh, if you can actually measure uh, the temperature dependence of suitability, uh, we typically expect that at high temperature for temperature that is bigger compared to the exchange energy scale of the system, then the local moments will follow a Curie-Weiss law, which looks like something like this, proportional to one over T minus theta. Theta is called Curie-Weiss temperature, is roughly equal to uh, the exchange interaction strength of the system. So if the system is ferromagnetic, the localized spin interacts with each other ferromagnetically, and uh, you will expect something like this, a uh, Curie-Weiss law diverge at a positive Curie-Weiss temperature. And if you plot one over the uh, chi, then it basically shows a linear dependence and the TC here, uh, or the Curie-Weiss temperature is positive for a ferromagnetic system. For anti-ferromagnetic system, then the Curie-Weiss temperature is negative. And then you would actually, if you plot one over chi, there you have a negative intercept, uh, negative temperature here. Okay. So if you can measure uh, the temperature dependence susceptibility of the system, that's uh, one of the you know, best ways to uh, really show the presence of uh, local moments in the system. Well, uh, that's not a, uh, entirely trivial because uh, there are not so many spins in the system. For instance, we think of, you know, we have a sample area about one micron square, the Moray period is 10 nanometer, we probably have about you know, 10,000 spins in the system. Well, which is not too terrible, but if you think about it, it's embedded in a big magnetic background as well, right? It's embedded in boron nitride, graphene and silicon. That's just, you know, it's a, uh, embedded in a, even it's a diamagnetic background, it's a very huge diamagnetic background in the system. So the way we do it is actually to resonantly enhance uh, the detection method so that we can just pick out the response of the WSE2 by just looking at a particular optical transition in the WSC2 to pick out this excitonic resonance uh, corresponding to this vertical transition here, specific to WSC2, that would just help us to sort of almost totally eliminate the big background uh, of uh, the substrate and other things. Well, it's a simple measurement. Uh, basically, you shine light onto the system and you just look at the reflected light intensity as a function of the wavelength or the photon energy of the system. And this is a reflection contrast spectrum uh, example shown here. It's measured at a zero magnetic field uh, for both left and right-handed channel, meaning that we shine left and right-handed light. We look at the difference for left and right-handed light. And you see almost no difference. The red curve and the black curve corresponding to each handedness of the light is almost exactly the same. Um, that's expected because it's a zero Tesla. We do not apply any magnetic field. So uh, the system does not break time reversal uh, the response is just the same for left and right-handed light. Oh, uh, by the way, this is fixed at filling factor equal to one at, in, at the mass state. Well, now if you increase uh, the magnetic field, then you can clearly see uh, a, a Zeeman splitting in the exciton resonance, which is this peak here uh, between the left and right-handed channel. And uh, you can actually trace the peak energy or uh, the splitting of the uh, peak energy for left and right-handed light as a function of the magnetic field, which is the Zeeman splitting of the exciton as a function of magnetic field. It looks something like this. Uh, it's linear at uh, near zero uh, Tesla, but it quickly saturates uh, to a, uh, you know, for magnetic field above one Tesla. It really is reflecting that the local moments in the system that's easily polarized by a magnetic field uh, on the order of one Tesla. And you can extract the slope near zero Tesla, which is actually the G factor for the Zeeman splitting. And one can show that actually the G factor here is proportional uh, to the magnetic susceptibility of the local moments here. And as I explained, uh, the local moments first gets uh, you know, aligned by the small magnetic field and then saturate for magnetic field, field above one Tesla. So this provides us a method uh, to actually measure the magnetic susceptibility 
not super quantitatively because of, you know, we don't really know this proportionality factor, not like squid, we can really perform a quantitative measurement of chi. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, in terms of looking at the temperature dependence is sufficient. And this is the result uh, for uh, the G factor, which is proportional to chi, as a function of temperature, a filling factor equal to one. And uh, the black dots are the data, and the red line is the Curie wise fit. And you can see that, and this is one over chi, basically one over the data at the top. And you can see that the Curie wise law fit very well over a wide temperature range, as well as, you know, over on almost two orders of magnitude uh, for the magnetic susceptibility. And we can actually extract by fitting this data, we can extract a Curie wise constant, which is about negative one Kelvin. And uh, that's basically the exchange energy scale that we have of the system is about negative 0.1 uh, MeV. And this can be compared to the super exchange mechanism as expected for a mild insulator that due to a second order tunneling process, virtual process uh, for electron hop from uh, to the other side, just momentarily and come back. And this will give us a, uh, a super exchange uh, energy scale equal to roughly T squared over U uh, you, uh, in terms of the parameters of the Hubbard model. And then uh, we actually have estimated what U is from the temperature measurement, which is a lower estimate. It's about 20 MeV. And we actually have measured theta, then we can actually calculate T, estimate T. T is about one MeV, uh, which actually agrees very well uh, with an initial band structure calculation that would give us actually a uh, bandwidth about you know, 10 MeV, but the bandwidth is about 60. So T is about you know, 1.5 MeV from calculation. So this is not that bad. And when you do the U over T is about 20. So uh, the system is really in the strongly interacting regime. And in this regime, you can sort of think of it the localized spins uh, in terms of the Heisenberg model that they you know, exchange, uh, have exchange interaction with each other for the local moments. Okay, and uh, all right, so far uh, I have been talking about, uh, how much time do I have? Probably seven minutes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll just very briefly uh, go through uh, some of the results uh, about, you know, a little bit about long range interaction. Then I maybe uh, just quickly highlight as um, I probably don't have really enough time to really go through uh, the rest of the talk. Uh, so far, I have only talking about on site Coulomb repulsion. But actually, uh, typically in a device, is that the gay distance is actually very big compared to the Moray's uh, length scale. The Moray, Moray length scale is about eight nanometer, but typically the gate to gate distance is about you know, 40 to 60 nanometer. And the Coulomb interaction is actually poorly screened by the gate. So we really have to uh, consider the long range uh, Coulomb interaction between the electrons. So in addition to the local U here, we should also consider the V uh, between the Moray sites. So uh, the correct model to really capture the physics is really you know, the extended Hubbard model uh, that uh, not only including the U, but we also include the long range V uh, in this system. Okay. And in fact, uh, the effect of a uh, next nearest neighbor, uh, the nearest neighbor uh, Coulomb repulsion effect actually was reviewed by uh, a paper this year by Feng Wang's group at Berkeley. That in addition to the uh, mass state, they also have observed two additional state at fractional fillings, uh, one third and two third filling. And uh, these are interpreted as a uh, generalized spinner crystal states or uh, charge order states. Uh, this is basically an attempt of the electronic system try to minimize the long-range Coulomb repulsion and form a charge order state in the system. Well, uh, maybe just a highlight that uh, with a new detection technique that I believe I probably don't have time to go through and a in improved quality sample, now we can actually see a, uh, not just a two of these additional uh, fractional states, but actually close to a uh, 20 of this a, uh, additional fractional states in the system. And so this uh, basically shows uh, an example of the, of the data that we get on this a high quality sample uh, is that this is the gate voltage. It turns the filling factor from negative two all the way to two. Negative means hole doping, positive means electron doping of the same material system. And you can see the band insulating state as well as the mild insulating state as uh, we discussed before. But in addition to that, you can actually see a bunch of fractional states uh, between filling factor zero and one as well as between filling factor one and two. 
And typically these fractional states are, you know, much more obvious in between uh, filling factor zero and one than between one and two. What we believe is actually that the kinetic energy of the electron is significantly increased uh, between filling factor one and two. And with reduced kinetic energy between zero and one, and the system really have a, is basically like a classical electron gas. And uh, these are just a uh, sort of like Wigner crystal states that try to minimize the long range Coulomb repulsion. Okay. And I don't really have time to go through uh, uh, the, how we detect this, but if you trust me, we have detected uh, these states and then maybe I just immediately tell you what these states are. And so our colleague, Vi Elsa, uh, basically used a uh, extended Hubbard model in the flat band limit. Basically, we just ignore the T. It's a purely classical model. And you can do Monte Carlo calculations uh, to figure out what the ground state is at different uh, commensurate filling factors. For instance, one half, two over five, uh, one third, one, one quarter, and things like that. These are the expected charge patterns that we would get for this fractional state here. And we can also measure the melting temperature of this charge order state. And this is the melting temperature of this charge order state. And this melting temperature agree very well uh, with just a simple extended Hubble model in the flat band limit. And in particular, in this classical model, you would expect a you know, perfect electron hole symmetry around filling factor one half, uh, because you can think of the uh, field side as particle and the empty side as holes, right? So. Uh, Two fifth and three fifth is just you know by inverting the field side and the empty side. So uh, the temperature is almost exactly the TC is almost exactly symmetric around filling factor one half, and that's really just captured by the uh, simple theoretical calculation as well. Well, there are some other you know more weird things going on. Uh, for instance, there's a little bit of asymmetry on the whole side, which we think is actually a reflection of the quantum effect that the ignorance of the T in the model. And also between filling factor one and two, you can actually see that in this case, the three half state actually isn't, even has higher TC compared to the four, four over three and five over three states, which is actually totally the opposite compared to you know, what's happening in between zero, uh, filling factor zero and one. So we believe that these are some you know, signatures of uh, the fact that we actually have to uh, include T in a more sophisticated theoretical model system, but that's a, uh, we are not entirely sure at this point. Well, I, uh, very quickly about uh, uh, also, you know, stride, uh, some of these days actually you can see that uh, it breaks a, a rotational symmetry spontaneously because uh, of the competition of short range and long range a Coulomb interaction. And uh, we actually look at these states in particular, we look at the, uh, the polarization rotation because if the state breaks rotational symmetry, if you send linearly polarized light into the system and it will rotate the polarization of the light, right? It's called optical birefringence. And you can measure this polarization rotation angle as a function of filling factor. And indeed, you actually can see that a peak in the rotation uh, of the polarization angle, peak at one half filling, that's the place you expect a strong stride phase. And this is actually expected. And this polarization angle rotation just quickly dies away uh, with filling factor away from one half filling. And what's actually interesting in this data is actually that when you compare with compressibility measurement and uh, that, you know, the incompressible states at one half filling is actually very sharp distribute in the, in the filling factor. But this peak is actually much broader compared to the incompressible states at filling factor one half. And uh, it actually, what it means is that in, even in the compressible region of this system, uh, it still breaks rotational symmetry. So it really suggests that the system uh, is some kind of a liquid crystal state uh, in between this compressible, re incompressible regions. Well, we can also image a, the, 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 the domain structure. So uh, then uh, well, to end this talk, I'll just give a, you know, a very brief outlook of what maybe we can do in the future with this system, several of the things that we can do and are doing. Uh, one of them is actually that this a uh, charge order state it has some interesting feature because you can actually change the symmetry of this electron lattice by just applying a gate voltage. And for instance, you can make it a quasi 1D chain. And some of the theories will also predict that you can actually make it a Kagami lattice. And uh, when you think about when you turn on the T in the system, that the electrons start to exchange with each other. And uh, we probably uh, can think of as some kind of a programmable spin model uh, in the system with tunable lattice structure. 
And uh, we recently measured the curie wise temperature as a function of filling more carefully. And you actually start to see that a strong dip uh, in the curie wise temperature at filling factor equal to two thirds in one of the samples. And uh, we also actually have measured using the same polarization rotation imaging method, we have measured directly image uh, the critical spin fluctuation of a two dimensional magnet. So this is a direct uh, video of showing that uh, the, uh, a monolayer of chromium bromide near its critical point, and you can see spontaneous fluctuation of the magnetic domains in the system. And you can trace its time dependence. And what's important is actually that we can measure from this data, the spin-spin correlation function of the system. And I think it's actually quite a powerful, interesting method uh, to do, to do uh, in particular, to apply this in a Moray system that we actually expect some kind of quantum phase transition happening. And the question is, can we use this method to directly image uh, critical spin fluctuation near the quantum critical point? And finally, I just briefly mentioned that a, uh, not just we can actually tune the filling factor of this Moray system, but we can actually also tune the interaction strength. Uh, say, for instance, the U over T or the V over T. The idea is actually to tune uh, the band separation uh, between the, you know, the Moray band in one TMD layer and the Moray band in the other TMD layer, which actually effectively tune the Moray potential in the system and therefore the bandwidth uh, of the, uh, of the Moray flat band. So if you tune this distance by an electric field, you can tune the bandwidth of the system. And effectively you are tuning U over T or V over T. And this is a, uh, you know, some preliminary data that uh, th from this side, we actually increase, you know, from a smaller delta to increase the delta. And you can see that the MOS state, uh, which is not there at the beginning, and then the MOS state emerge after you tune, you know, you decrease the bandwidth of the system. So that this is a really uh, close to be something like a mod hubba transition that is a, tra a metal insulated transition induced by a tuning the U over T in the system that we think is probably quite interesting um, because it's a triangular lattice as well. So maybe uh, in at some critical U over T, if we can also measure the magnetic response, uh, this may be a quantum spin uh, a liquid state uh, near, the, near some critical values of U over T. So uh, with this, I just uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to, you know, uh, just take any questions. Thank you, bye for a very interesting talk. Um, yeah, Leon has a question. Uh, yeah, beautiful talk. Um, uh, thank you. Can I, can I come back to the early on where you're showing the measurement using the exciton splitting of the, uh, uh, you know, estimating yes. a curie vice temperature. So this, the yeah. data, I guess, is at uh, filling one. Yeah. Um, you know, in a Hubbard-like system, it's interesting to ask how this so exchange enhancement, uh, I mean, the Curie-Weiss susceptibility is, I don't know, probably in this case would be something like a factor of 20, maybe larger than the, the Pauli susceptibility of a corresponding metal. Um, mm -hmm. So would yeah. you see, have you studied how this changes with filling? Yeah, um, uh, so yeah, actually, uh, Maybe I just, do I have data to show? Yeah, we have studied it and actually I don't have the uh, data to, well, but actually this is uh, the, yeah, the extracted curie wise temperature, basically from the same measurement that we measure, uh, the temperature dependence of the chi uh, nice. at different filling factors. This is filling factor one. And uh, yeah, there, there is some change at the, some charge order states, right, at some commensurate filling factor. Uh, but overall, there's sort of like a peak, peak and near about one half filling. And uh, if you trust uh, what I say here, without showing the data, because I don't have that slide here, is that uh, at a high temperature limit, even for this, uh, for filling factor away from one, the system is largely compressible in most of the region. Uh, it follows the Curie-Wise law pretty well, quite well, actually, uh, in the high temperature limit. But it starts to deviate. Uh, from the Kirby Weiss law uh, in the low temperature limit, it actually deviates more compared to the filling factor one. So uh, is that some kind of signature to say that uh, it's, the system is some, developing some sort of a metallic coherence to go into something like a uh, uh, poly susceptibility? Uh, I'm not so sure. Probably we just need to measure the lower temperature. Mm. But usually Pauli susceptibility is smaller, right? I mean, so the denominator yeah. in the in the Curie Weiss law is 
something like J, which is T squared over U, where mm -hmm. in the yeah, then uh, in that sense, we just did not see any uh, poly like uh, behavior in uh, in in this system. It's like uh, at least for filling factor below one, we just always see Curie wise behavior in a high temperature limit. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So can I uh, can I ask? Uh, okay. So uh, I wanted to ask about uh, if you could say more about time uh, measurements of spin fluctuations. You mentioned it towards the end. Yeah. Uh, so so just so you measure it. So it's um you observe it's a function of time. But I mean, what is your spatial resolution? You 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 measure the full sample. Yeah. Or? It's a, it's a full sample. So this is really the uh, size, you know, it's inside the sample. The dash line is the boundary of the sample. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an exfoliated flick. And uh, roughly the length scale from this to that is about, you know, five to 10 micron. And the sp uh, spatial resolution is an optical measurement. It's about half a micron. So high, uh, and uh, 500 nanometer, if you think you apply to Moray system, the Moray length scale is about 10 nanometer. So it's, it will be about 50 by 50 sites. Okay. Uh, that would be the resolution of the system. But of course, this is actually not a Moray system. This is real atomic spin system. Then there will be many, many spins, you know, millions, millions of spins uh, inside that spot there. Sure, yes. So, I mean, yeah. but you, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For you, it's a uh, number for the 100. Yeah, yeah and... Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, you can calculate the, uh, the time correlation function, right, as well as the spatial correlation function uh, using these images. Uh, but so far at this point, what's limiting the spatial correlation function is actually the sample inhomogeneity that uh, I think different parts of the sample have slightly different TC. So <laughs> we, you know, we don't really see it like a divergence of the, you know, of the correlation link through the entire sample in this measurement. Mm -hmm. But it's something like a spin noise measurement, right? I mean, yeah, it's like a spin noise measurement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, <clears throat> uh, I have a question about uh, magnetism. Do you see any indications of uh, uh, approaching ferromagnetic state? Because theoretically, if you are close to half filling and you are slightly away from half filling. Uh, then there may be something like Nagaoka ferromagnetism. And there were some yes. theoretical results from Landau Institute, Yardansky, that they claimed that there would be something like unsaturated ferromagnetism, not really full Nagaoka ferromagnetism, but something like that. Do you see anything like that? Yeah, so the answer is actually no. Uh, we actually did not see anything like that. So this is filling factor one, and you can see that uh, the curie wise temperature is actually negative when you go away, uh, slightly away from filling factor one. And uh, I, I think I may have an answer for this, but uh, uh, the theorist can correct me uh, because it's a triangular lattice system. And I have seen a theory paper basically saying that uh, if you have a uh, triangular lattice system, you dope away from a slightly dope away from a one half filling, the corresponding uh, Nagauta na, na, na magnetism is actually an antiferromagnetic rather than ferromagnetic. No, but that's exactly, that's exactly what I said. There were some old results by Yardansky in Smirnov from Landau Institute, and they claim that uh, it will be not really full saturated ferromagnetism like Nagaoka, but there might be still unsaturated ferromagnetism still. Mm -hmm. they going for, they in triangular letters, that's exactly what they looked at. I see, I see, I see. So uh, this might be relevant. Um, at least certainly it's not a ferromagnetic system. So you don't see any indication of that? Okay, no, very good. No, yeah. Now, uh, yet maybe one more question, if you allow me. Uh, yeah. Can you just uh, control long-range uh, interaction by, for example, putting something like metallic layer nearby by in increasing screening? What would become of all this to suppress this? Uh, yeah, charge? actually, yeah. This can be done. You can actually uh, put a metallic layer like one nanometer away, and the charge of the states are gone because that's due to you know, a long-range coulomb. But uh, we can also tune this more continuously by this method of tuning the bandwidth. And actually, you can see that the fractional states at this uh, particular state, which is 2 plus 2 thirds filling, it's also gone uh, when you, you know, tune the bandwidth of the system. So, uh, yeah, effectively, you can do screening or you can actually tune the bandwidth of the system. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. 
may I ask you a question? Um, um, so, Fai, this is really beautiful. Okay. I, um, Thank you. I, I was, um, the spins that you were looking at, to what extent mm -hmm. are they um, pure spins versus um, versus spin orbit coupled states yes. and yes, a uh, good question. Yeah, and um, so uh, yeah, this as uh, we, we we say that in the large U over the limit of filling factor equal to one, then it's like a Heisenberg model. But this is actually not the real spin of the system; it's a the value pseudo spin of the system. Right. So, uh, but uh, the value coupled to out of plane magnetic field, just like real spin. Right. So, and because we are looking at out of plane magnetic field response, so it's a, it's, as you say, it's a coupled spin value degree of freedom. Uh, and and so the the g factor at um, the g factor when you're uh, when you don't have a magnetic state or when you go to high temperature, uh, what is the g factor for these value degrees of freedom? Oh, uh, yeah, the, uh, that would be the bare G factor. I did not explain a, uh, this value here, G0. Uh, right. That would be actually the bare exciton G factor. Say you can go to high temperature, the G factor is equal to, the G0 is equal to negative four, or you can go to zero filling, that no local moments in the system, right? The G, G0 is also equal to negative four in right. that case. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a, a lot smaller compared to, you know, uh, the system. That's like a background, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I see Vladimir also has a question. Uh, yes, um, uh, every time I hear this, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me more and more. I have a, I have a specific question right now. Um, I noticed that if you look at different feelings, uh, when feelings are between zero and one, there are a lot of charge order states you found. And mm -hmm. um, above one, there are much fewer. And uh, th uh, there is another thing that I've noticed, which is when um, you look at magnetism, there some, seems to be some ferromagnetic correlations above feeling one and below feeling one is uh, antiferromagnetic. So do you think that there is actually a connection between, you know, uh, the distribution of these ordered charge ordered states and the magnetism? Uh, yeah, so... Um... I don't know whether I have a good answer for that, uh, but, but what, what I think what's happening is actually that a uh, the number uh, of or how robust, right, or how high the TC for this charge order states is sort of reflecting the bandwidth of the system, because I think you know the long range Coulomb repulsion for the localized electron more or less remain the same, and uh, so I, I believe what's really what it really means for the from the data directly is saying that uh, the second Hubble band here the bandwidth is actually quite a bit uh, larger compared to the first Hubble band, so that you mm -hmm. have much fewer uh, these states. And uh, then uh, how this you know, increased T, right, in the second Hubble band would just be translated to, to a, uh, the magnetism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly related, right, because magnetism, you really have to turn on the T in, in, in the Hubble model. But uh, I actually don't know how to you know, predict that it should be, you know, whether the, yeah, you're, you're right that actually above this filling factor, like 1.2, the system go from, you know, antiferromagnetic to slightly ferromagnetic, right? But whether this change in T is re uh, related to that, I, I, we don't know, yeah. Right. But we, we, one thing we do know is that the T is actually much bigger uh, for the second half of band, right. yeah. Well, what comes to mind is once you put charge order states, then, you know, it, it rearranges the bands somehow, and there's a lower Hubble band, there will be some other empty bands. So, you know, it, it kind of becomes more like a charge transfer situation once you undergo uh, charge ordering. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I wonder if that will actually then the resulting magnetism may be influenced by some, you know, residual charge fluctuation. That's what I came to my mind. Yeah, and maybe one thing I can also uh, um, connect is that uh, the U in the system, right, the onset Coulomb repulsion is actually bigger compared to the band and more band separation. So the U actually can mix the bands uh, uh, a little mm -hmm. bit. So the real situation is actually a little bit more complicated than we just think about, you know, the single particle band structure here. Mm -hmm. But we certainly see, you know, first Hubble band, second Hubble like band, right? Um, it may be, but it could be totally a, uh, a charge transfer type of scenario as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, let me ask the last question. Okay. Um, so uh, at half Berlin, you have triangular Heisenberg model. I think it, so. You, in addition to nearest neighbor, you, you can also have next nearest neighbor interactions. So 
uh, in principle, I think by tuning the twisting angle, you can tune the relative strength of J1 and J2. So is it yes. possible to, to reach the spin liquid? Yeah, uh, so that's a, uh, uh, actually that's uh, Alan McDonald's uh, original uh, theoretical proposal uh, that you can actually tune the twist angle to tune to, you know, near the critical J1, J2 of the system and potentially realize some a uh, spin liquid state, right? Uh, but we are thinking, you know, uh, tuning the twist angle experimentally is actually not uh, that easy, especially continuously, it's not easy. You just have to uh, make different sample and sometimes comparing different sample is dangerous. So uh, we hope to have a method to actually uh, tune it continuously, but I don't know whether this will work. Uh, so that's why we actually do this, uh, use this method to use electric field to tune the bandwidth of the system. And uh, this sort of effectively is tuning a, the, the interaction strength uh, in the Hubble model. And uh, maybe uh, this can also be a potential route to realize, you know, some kind of spin liquid state near the, you know, uh, interaction to the metal insulated transition. So that's a, uh, you know, that we think it's probably more promising experimentally because we can tune continuously. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Okay, let's thank Phi again okay. for a very nice talk. Okay, thank um, you.